Hi, you're listening to Bonus Points, the official podcast of Mr. Astle's theology class. Join us as we put out into the deep and explore the world of theology and beyond. Today, we're talking about one of my favorite saints and one that's important to all of my listeners at school, St. Joseph. Let's begin. First, I just want to say how incredible it is to be sitting here recording episode 11. Um, I I didn't really think it was going to get this far. I know on average, a new podcast just kind of fades away after a few episodes. So uh, I think I've now cracked beyond that first statistic that I've actually put out 10 episodes now here recording episode 11. So I just want to say a very big thank you to all of my listeners, all of my supporters. I know I mentioned this in a previous episode, but I figured that this would be, you know, maybe a couple people listening, a handful, maybe. Um, but here I am looking at looking at my analytics, looking at the statistics, and um, just being blown away by the numbers that I'm seeing. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, with every episode, I, I get more comfortable with doing this, with recording. And so... I'm actually, I'm, I'm making less of a script now. Um, I told myself at the beginning that for the first few episodes, I would, I would write out a script and I would more or less follow it to a T. Um, but as I'm becoming more comfortable with the mic, I'm using less of a script. So today I'm working just with an outline. Um, you can probably tell from how much I'm rambling more, but that's okay. Cause here we are in episode 11 uh, if you like what you hear, make sure you subscribe, make sure you share it with someone else who would like it. That's a, that's about, I don't have like a Patreon or anything, so I don't make any money off of this. Um, your support is why I do this, uh, and you, you, your listening means the world to me. So, let's talk about St. Joseph. His solemnity was celebrated um, just this past weekend. I'm recording this on Monday. His solemnity was on Saturday. And this, I thought this would be a good topic because we don't know much about him. Um, when we talk about St. Joseph, he's sort of just the, the, just like sometimes we minimize St. Francis of Assisi into just the bird feeder. Um, sometimes we minimize St. Joseph to the other person that was there in my nativity set. Uh, when really there's so, so much more that we can say about him. Even if we don't know many details about his life, he's still this incredible saint who can be this incredible role model for us. So my own devotion to St. Joseph um, has definitely grown a lot in the last couple of years. Before I started teaching here at St. Joe's, you know, I didn't have a problem with him or anything, but I wouldn't have said that I had a very strong devotion to St. Joseph. Since getting hired to teach here, I thought, well, I should probably get to know our patron a little bit more. And my devotion, my personal devotion to St. Joseph has just grown more and more and more since then. And the same thing kind of happened with the church. Again, it's not like the church ever had a problem with St. Joseph, obviously. But for much of the church's history, you didn't really see this really strong devotion to St. Joseph. I mean, he wasn't even made the patron of the Universal Church until 1870. Um, that was just over 150 years ago. And that's when his, um, so when Pope Pius, I think it was Pope Pius the ninth, uh, declared him to be the patron of the universal church. That's when he elevated St. Joseph's feast day to a double of the first class or what we would call a solemnity today. So before that, uh, we wouldn't have even spoken of the solemnity of St. Joseph the way we do today. So devotion to St. Joseph is definitely something that has been growing more and more uh, in recent church history. And of course, I'm using recent as kind of a relative term because it was 150 years ago that he was made patron of the Universal Church. Um, And then, of course, not too long ago, much, much more recently, Pope Francis declared the year of St. Joseph um, to coincide with the 150th anniversary of that declaration. So, in any case... Devotion to St. Joseph has been growing more and more and more, both in my own life and in the life of the church universal. So I thought it'd be good to talk about what do we know about St. Joseph? 
what details can we piece together from the biblical accounts, from archaeology? Um, basically, what, what do we know about the guy? So let's start with his family. Um, we know that Joseph was from the house of David. He was from the line of David, meaning he was a descendant of the great King David. Um, we know that his father existed. Uh, and this is, this is one of those things that's unique about Scripture. So both Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel give us a genealogy of Jesus. But the thing is, those genealogies are not identical. Um, for example, in Matthew's Gospel, it says, you know, uh, that, that Jesus was the son of Joseph, who was the son of Jacob. And I'd say Matthew says that. He actually goes the other direction. But in any case, he tells us that St. Joseph's father's name was Jacob. Now, when we look at Luke's genealogy, we see that Luke's father's name is a guy named Heli. So what's going on? Is this um, a contradiction? Is this a problem? Not necessarily. So there are a few, there are actually a couple possible explanations for this and why the genealogies given are different. The first thing is that in Hebrew, uh, there's no, there, there aren't as many different family relationship words as we have in English. So you don't have a different word to talk about a grandfather, a great-grandfather, a great-great-grandfather. Any, any male uh, ancestor is called father. So that's why both Joseph and Jesus at different points in scripture are referred to as the son of David. Um, not because David was their father, you know, he was their great, 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 however many greats, but the Hebrew expression would still be um, that David is his father or that he is the son of David. That said, when um, you were making a genealogy, they had no problem with skipping generations. Um, and we, we see this when we look throughout the genealogies given in these two gospels, they are, they have no problem with jumping over a few uh, and they, they don't say anything different other than uh, so-and-so became the father of so-and-so, when in reality there may have been two or three or even four generations in between those guys. But they, they just skip over them because the purpose of a genealogy was to establish kind of where you came from, right? It wasn't supposed to be a precise genetic record person by person. So they were fine skipping generations. So it could have been that. Um, it could have, that could have been, uh, one of the explanations is that Matthew and or Luke skips around a little. There's, in my opinion, a more likely explanation though, and it has to do with the concept of leveret marriage. Um, okay, so what is that? Leveret marriage is a legal concept that we find in the law of Moses, specifically in Deuteronomy 25. And it essentially says, so levir means brother, I think, um, yeah, that, that, I'm pretty sure that's what it means. Or in-law, something, it's, it's something like that. Anyway, leveret marriage means that um, if you have a man who gets married and dies childless, he dies without any children, it is his brother's responsibility to marry his widow and to have children. And those children, even though they're biologically the sons of um, the original guy's brother, from a legal standpoint, they would be considered sons of uh, that original man who died childless, because the whole point of this law is to say we don't want these law or these these family lines going extinct, and so you you have another close relative who's going to continue the line for you, and both of those guys, both the legal father and the biological father, would just be called his father. So it could have been that. Um, it's possible that. There was some lever at marriage, a generation or two above Joseph, and that that led to Joseph having a different biological father and legal father. And in fact, this is the exact explanation that Eusebius gives. Um, Eusebius is well known as one of the first historians of the church. He wrote a book uh, called Ecclesiastical History, or sometimes just Church History. He says, um, that Joseph's grandfather, Mathen, who we do see mentioned, um, I think it's in Matthew's genealogy, married a woman named Esther, 
and they had a son named Jacob. And then Mathan died, Esther got remarried to his relative Melki, and they had a son, Heli. So Jacob and Heli were, would have been half-brothers. And then Heli died childless, so his half-brother Jacob married his widow, and they had a son, and that son was St. Joseph, which meant that Joseph would be biologically the son of Jacob, but legally the son of Heli. Um, and that, that's one way to, I find that very convincing, a way to explain that discrepancy is, oh yeah, and it makes sense that in the thousand years that this genealogy covers, um, thousand plus years, you're, you're going to have a few situations where a man dies childless, and so you have a lever at marriage. Anyway, so whether, uh, no matter how we resolve this, we know that Joseph was from the line of David. Uh, he was a descendant of King David, which is super, super important. Because, of course, the Messiah is going to be from the line of David. Now, that said, Joseph was not the only descendant of David who was around. In fact, um, pretty much the entire town of Nazareth was made up of descendants of David. Um, so Nazareth itself, we, we don't know a whole lot about it because it wasn't that important of a town uh, prior to Jesus being, uh, or Jesus growing up in it. So we know that Nazareth was founded by returned exiles. So um, you have the, the Jews who are deported to Babylon after the declaration of Cyrus the Great. They're allowed to return. Many don't. Oddly enough, many choose to stay in Babylon. But those that return um, find their territories kind of in ruins. And so you see some new towns start to spring up where they're trying to rebuild. And one of those towns was named Nazareth. Uh, from the Hebrew for shoot, uh, kind of the, that shoot springing up. And most of the inhabitants of Nazareth were descendants of David in one form or another. And so that's part of why they named their town Nazareth, the, the shoot from the stump of Jesse. So there was really this, um, this really deep expectation that the Messiah was going to, to be coming soon. Um, and especially in a town like Nazareth, you can almost imagine Every time there was a young woman who was pregnant, that's the other women in town saying, you know, he could be the one, right? Um, this, this could be it. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they had said that about Joseph when he was born. Is this the one? Is this the Messiah? In any case, we know that Nazareth was a very small town. Um, now, we don't have, you know, uh, census records the way we have today, but based on what we do find archaeologically and from records uh, from about a hundred years before Jesus, we would estimate that the population of Nazareth was about a hundred and twenty to one hundred and fifty people um, total. So not that many. All right. One of the other really really big disputes about Saint Joseph is: was he young or was he old? Um, and there there are two different traditions. Both of them are ancient, so it's not like. The ancient tradition says this, and then, well, more recent people say this. There is ancient evidence for both of these. Um, let, me, let me just summarize what these two theories are. Some people say that St. Joseph was old, um, that he was a widower, that he had been married before he married Mary, that he had a family, and then his wife died. And then you have uh, this young woman, Mary of Nazareth, who we call you know, the Blessed Virgin Mary, Our Lady, uh, we know that she had taken a vow of virginity. She had, had essentially pledged herself to a life of celibacy. If convents existed the way they do today, she probably would have become a nun, but they didn't, so she couldn't. But in any case, she had taken this vow of virginity, but she needed somewhere to go. So th this wasn't super uncommon um, for young women and even young men to take a vow of celibacy but they would usually still get married uh, because, again, especially a young woman like Mary, she's going to need somebody to take care of her, to provide for her materially. They just would never consummate the marriage. Um, and so that's one of the traditions is that Mary knew that she needed somebody. Hey, here's uh, Joseph. He's a widower. He's, you know, he's old. He's the, You guys aren't going to consummate the marriage. So... Just get married to him and he'll take care of you. Um, 
There's also the theory that Joseph was young, that they were just getting married the way young people get married. Even if um, he knew that Mary had a vow of celibacy, that doesn't mean he wouldn't have married her, uh, but that he was younger. And younger here, um, if, if they were following the cultural customs of the time, uh, we know Mary would have been you know, about 14, and Joseph wouldn't have been that much older, um, somewhere in his late teens or early 20s, depending. Uh, but definitely a young man. I find this particular theory more convincing for two reasons. The first one um, is that when we look at the gospel accounts, Joseph, I mean, he travels on foot in the middle of the night to Egypt, which doesn't seem like something that if Joseph was as old as, as those traditions say, I don't think that would have been very likely that he was able to go to Jerus or go to Egypt like that, to make a long journey like that. But the other reason has to do with um, people's expectations about those who have a vow of celibacy. I think a lot of the times um, people assume St. Joseph must have been old because, well, he was married to Mary, but they never consummated the marriage. So there must have been a reason that, um, that he must, oh, he must have just been old and kind of over it, you know. Uh, if Joseph was a young man, they never would have been able to restrain themselves, and 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 Mary would have not would not have kept her vow of celibacy, which doesn't really seem like that strong of an argument. I mean, we know that uh, people are able to to practice virtue and and keep their vows no matter what their age is. So the church doesn't have an official position on this. We can just as well believe that Saint Joseph was old or young. Personally, I'm more persuaded by the young Joseph theories, um, but there, I, there are some good arguments uh, for an old Joseph as well. I just don't remember what they are right now. Anyway, what else do we know about St. Joseph? Scripture calls him um, the carpenter. So from, that's the first thing. You know he must have been pretty good at it if they called him the carpenter. The Greek word there that we translate as carpenter is tecton, um, which generally meant craftsman. Uh, it didn't necessarily just refer to somebody who worked with wood. It it would have referred to any sort of handyman or, or skilled laborer. So in a town as small as Nazareth, it's possible that Joseph was the tecton in the sense that he was the only one. Um, but not necessarily. There could have been other tectons in town. But Joseph would have been your guy for whatever you needed. So whether that was um, a new roof or a new wall or, or a fence, whatever it was, Joseph would have, he would have been your guy. You would have called him up, not literally called him. You would have gone to summon him. Uh, you would have hired him. He would have come to do the work. And he would have done any sort of skilled labor in the town. Now, at this time, though, we also have uh, King Herod the Great, who was also crazy, but that's a topic for another episode. He was good at architecture. I'll give him that. Uh, you know, um, he did slaughter the innocents, which was bad. But he was really good as an architect. And so he um, funded all these incredible, incredible building projects. Think of uh, the restored temple or, or the expanded temple complex that's there when Jesus is in Jerusalem. Um, he, he was always building these different projects in and around Judea. And so a tecton like Joseph would have had no trouble finding work. In addition to any jobs he would have been hired for in Nazareth, um, he probably also would have, would have had a part in some of these large building projects. And in those cases, he may have specialized. So a tecton would specialize in something like carpentry or masonry, but they, like the, he would have done more things in a small town like Nazareth. But if he was working on one of these huge construction sites, he probably would have been able to focus just on woodwork because there would have been other tectons for other jobs. So we can imagine daily life for St. Joseph. If he was part of one of these major construction projects, he would have woken up early um, and he would have walked to the job site wherever it was. He would have spent the day uh, building or, or doing whatever he needed to do. And with a lot of these um these larger building projects, the buildings themselves were mostly stone, but there were different wood pieces that were needed even for the process of construction. Think of scaffolds or um, 
different hinges or, or different platforms that were used for moving blocks. So even if the structure itself didn't incorporate much wood, Joseph still would have been pretty busy just with the logistics of building that building. Eventually, at the end of the workday, he would have received his wages, uh, you were paid daily usually, and then he would have walked back home uh, in time for dinner. So definitely a, a busy job, um, definitely one that uh, he would have been exhausted by the end of the day. Um, but we, he must have been good at it, again, because Scripture calls him the carpenter, the tecton. What else does Scripture say about him? Well, we have this one description. It says that Joseph was a just man. Now, what does that mean? Um, first and foremost, when Scripture refers to somebody as being just, what they mean is, um, or sometimes you hear it translated righteous, what that means is they followed the law. They, they followed God's will. And so the fact that Joseph is described in this way means that he must have been very observant. He must have uh, observant in the sense of following the law. And he would have taught Jesus to do the same. Um, at some point, he gets, he is betrothed to Mary. Um, and marriage, so nowadays, marriage is a little bit different. Back in the day, marriage happened kind of in two parts. You had the first part where um, the man would go to the, the bride's family. They would make all the arrangements. They would ag agree to the marriage. Uh, and then they would have this legal ceremony, which we would call like the betrothal. So after this point, they were called um, betrothed. But it was still a binding legal agreement. Nowadays, when we say that two people are betrothed or engaged, you know, it's not a legal process. Um, it's just an agreement that they will get married soon, but uh, you can break off an engagement with no problem. A betrothal in this context was an actual legal arrangement. That's why even though it says that they were betrothed, Joseph still contemplates divorcing Mary because you, there would have been a legal procedure there. In any case, betrothal, that first stage of the marriage, um, they wouldn't have lived together yet. Joseph would have been preparing their house and then eventually he would go and, and they would have, um, have the, another wedding ceremony. They would end with a procession to the new house. Before that happened, though, um, Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant. And scripture says that because he was a just man, he was unwilling to expose her to shame. So he planned to divorce her quietly. And you're like, well, uh, that doesn't sound like a just man to me. Um, but think about the options here. Uh, and this is, this is where we have a couple different theories of why Joseph plans to divorce Mary. The first one is perhaps the most well-known, and that's the suspicion theory. Joseph, um, according to this theory, hears that Mary's pregnant and assumes that she's been unfaithful. And so legally, he could demand the death penalty of her. He could, he could demand that she be stoned. But because he's a just man, he wants to find a solution to this that will still respect the law, and so he plans to divorce her. Um, there's another theory uh, called the perplexity theory that says that Joseph believes her when she says that uh, she has not been with somebody else, but he has no idea what's going on. He's just confused, and so he just wants to get out of this and, and go about his, he wants to move on with his life and put this strange incident behind him. Until, of course, the angel appears and explains what's going on. The third theory um, is, is called the awe theory, or the wonder and awe theory, because it says that Joseph believed Mary when she said that, um, that it was the Holy Spirit. But he had the same reaction that Peter has when he meets Jesus, where he says, Lord, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Basically, Joseph recognizes that he's in the presence of a great mystery and doesn't feel that he's worthy, and so his plan is, you know, I'm going to divorce her quietly so that then she can get married to somebody who's actually worthy of, of being part of this. And then the angel says, you know, you're fine. Stay here. Um, I find this most plausible. The, the church, again, does not have an official position on this. We are free to, to accept any of these three theories. I'm most persuaded by that third one. Um, in part because it makes sense of what the angel says to Joseph. When the angel says, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. He doesn't say, 
Um, do not be afraid to trust Mary, like trust her, or uh, let me explain because I can tell you're confused. He says, don't be afraid. And so that implies that Joseph maybe did have some trepidation going into this. Anyway, um, they then have to go to Bethlehem for the census because Joseph was of the line of David and Bethlehem was the city of David. We all know what happens there. Uh, we see Joseph mentioned um, in the flight to Egypt, he's told to, in a dream, to take his family to Egypt to escape the power of Herod, who was trying to kill him, kill Jesus. And then they come back. Eventually, they settle in Nazareth. And Joseph would have just gone back to his daily life, um, working as a tecton. As a father, he would have been responsible for teaching Jesus the law, which is just incredible when you think about it. I mean, here's here is... This St. Joseph literally teaching the word of God to the word of God. You know, that's just, man, that's awesome. And then at some point, Joseph dies. Now, we don't know when. Um, it was probably before the ministry of Jesus started because he's, he never comes up when uh, Jesus is exercising his public ministry. We know that Joseph is, is dead before the crucifixion because Joseph, or Jesus entrusts Mary to St. John. But we don't know when or how he dies. It was at some point between the finding in the temple when Jesus was 12 and when Jesus was 30. That's about as specific as we can get. Um, most ancient traditions say that Joseph died immediately before Jesus started his ministry, so when Jesus was about 30. But we don't really know. Uh, and that's part of why we call St. Joseph the patron of a happy death, because he died with Jesus and Mary by his side. All right, now I know that... Um, this episode's already kind of getting on the longer side, uh, but I do want to talk for a minute about the spirituality that we find in St. Joseph or how we, our spirituality, our prayer life can be informed by St. Joseph. So what does a Joseph-inspired spiritual life look like? The first characteristic that I would have to identify is silence. Um, Joseph was silent in scripture. He never says a word. Uh, which is incredible. It, he, he never says anything. Now, of course, we know that he would have spoken in real life, but scripture does not record anything. He's, he's small. He's hidden. Even in scripture, um, the details are sparse. But that silence is incredibly valuable because it is in that silence that we're able to hear God's voice. Um, and in fact, silence is the only place we can hear God's voice. And so Joseph is able to to recognize God's will. He has these dreams, right? Just like Joseph in the Old Testament, Joseph in the New Testament is a dreamer. Um, and you got to think, man, we've ha we've all had some weird dreams, right? Uh, but we don't wake up and say, okay, that's clearly a message from God, and I'm going to do this now, and I trust him. You would have to be incredibly well in tune with the voice of God uh, to be able to tell the difference between an angel appearing to you in a dream and just a weird dream about angels. So we know that Joseph, if we want to cultivate this Joseph-centered spirituality, we need that silence so that we can know what God's voice sounds like. And then we need to trust radically in God and in his plan, even when it is difficult. I mean, think about St. Joseph. He has this dream where an angel warns him that Herod is coming to kill his son and he needs to go to Egypt. And what does scripture say? He rose in the middle of the night and took them. Um, his trust in God led to this immediate obedience to the will of God. And hopefully we all do that as well, that we are prompt in obeying the will of God, that we don't wait around, we don't procrastinate. If we know God wants us to do something, we just, we do it because we trust God so much. This, by the way, this trust in God is why we call St. Joseph the terror of demons, because um, Satan's great sin was pride, right? His non-servium, I will not serve. And so there is nothing uh, as repulsive to the demons as true prompt obedience to the Lord. And so where Satan said, non-servium, I will not serve, Joseph and Mary say, servium, I will serve. I am the handmaid of the Lord, as Mary says. And so that's what makes St. Joseph the terror of demons is just his, his radical trust in God. So what can we take from all this? Um, Joseph is a model husband. So uh, husbands out there, look to him to be your model, to be your guide. 
he is a model of a father. Even though he was the legal father of Jesus and not his biological father, he still shows us what it means to be a father who provides for his family, who cares for his family, who protects his family. Joseph is a model worker. Uh, In just a few months here in May, we'll celebrate the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker. He shows us how to work hard, how to work well, how to glorify God in our labor. And finally, he is a model of prayer. That in his silence, um, in the time he spent just being with Jesus, um, we will call that contemplation, right? He just, he spends years and years just being with Jesus. Uh, And we can only speculate, we can only imagine um, what that time was like when they were just there together. The, The holy home of Nazareth is the center of contemplation. Anyway. There's so much more we could say about St. Joseph, um, but I'm already longer than uh, a normal episode, so I'll stop there. I do want to leave you with a few resources, though, if you want to read more. Two fantastic books that I can't recommend enough. Um, Both came out pretty recently, uh, in part because of the year of St. Joseph. One of them is St. Joseph and His World by Mike Aquilina, and the other is Through the Heart of St. Joseph by Father Boniface Hicks. And both of those guys have a connection to our school because both of them have come here to speak before. So um, if you've been around for a while, you may remember seeing either of those. I'm also going to have a link to three different papal documents. The first is Quemod Modum Deus by Pius IX. That was the the document where he declared Joseph to be the patron of the Universal Church. I'll also be linking to Redemptoris Custos and Patris Corde. Uh, which are JP2 and Pope Francis' encyclicals on St. Joseph. And finally, I'll have a link to Ecclesiastical History by Eusebius, where he talks about the early church tradition regarding the father of St. Joseph. Um, and again, he's, he's a voice from the early church, so he's especially important here. Anyway, that is uh, it for today. Make sure you subscribe and share this with someone else who you think will like it. Hopefully, um, this new, less scripted format is good. Uh, I think it went well, but we'll see. In any case, that's all I have for you today. Have a great rest of your day, and um, well, I'm ending this like I'm ending class. I almost said I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, I'll see you the next time you tune in for bonus points.